all of Germany. I mean, where, if I couldn't buy a 70-inch television in America on a Sunday, there would be riots everywhere. Um, but uh, I noticed also there's not a lot of outside advertising, but the outside advertising that there is in Munich is all about this. This is the iPad, if you haven't seen it, on every bus kiosk in town and everywhere in the world. This is just the latest fantastic product from Apple. You've all heard of it. You've all seen it. This replaced the last unbelievable product, the iPhone, and before that, the, the iPod and the Macs and, and all the other Apples before that. And it seems like this stuff spilling out of Silicon Valley is, is, is never ending. So uh, I am from the independent nation of Silicon Valley. I'm kind of a diplomat, so you can't arrest me, actually. And, uh, you know, I actually used to work for Steve Jobs back in 1979 and 80. I, uh, I didn't work for Apple, but I did work for Steve. I was his home remodeling contractor. It was a, it was a tough year, I can tell you. <laughs> oh, God, it was hard. Uh, in fact, I was trying to remodel his house with him sleeping on a mattress on the floor. Really, he slept for the whole year on a mattress on the floor. And when he was on the cover of Time magazine, they showed him sitting in his living room with his legs crossed. Oh, he's, he's been to India. He's this ascetic guy. He's a Buddhist and all. He couldn't buy furniture. He couldn't pick a mattress. I used to argue with him about quality. I said, he'd say, this doorknob rattles. I said, well, it's cost $80. You know, it's, it's fine. You know, it was expensive. Just leave it. He, he said, no, no, I, it has to be better than that. And... I was completely incompetent. I have no idea what I was doing there. I mean, it was my second job ever, but it was, <clears throat> you know, it, it was his first house. Um, but the iPad, you know, it turned out <clears throat> that his products were a big deal, and we kind of think we're the center of the universe in Silicon Valley. Uh, I mean, it is a global effort, but we kind of think we're the center. And uh, I want to tell you where, where this comes from. You know, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, in fact, I'm going to tell you something about the origin and I think it's kind of amazing. <clears throat> One reason Silicon Valley is where it is is because of this ship here. This is the Macon. This was designed by Goodyear and Zeppelin and built in 1929 and 30 in the United States. And it was brought to Silicon Valley, to Sunnyvale, uh, when the people in Sunnyvale uh, offered the land around Moffett Air Station to the federal government for a dollar if they'd bring this airship. And they did bring it, and the, the whole effort was a complete failure. It was, it was there for 19 months, and as we know, you know, the whole airship industry went out in the 30s. But around the Naval Air Station grew up these little avionics firms like Varian and uh, Fairchild and Hewlett Packard, and it started this fledgling avionics industry. Now, another reason Silicon Valley is where it is is because of this. This is an early vacuum tube. And this vacuum tube allowed the electronic age. It was, it was actually invented by Lee DeForest, and they were manufactured in Palo Alto. And at first, it was used for uh, communications. It was used for radios to amplify signals. And later, it was used in x-ray machines. And finally, it was made into a switch for fledgling computers. And this morphed into the transistor, which turned into the microprocessor, which is printed on silicon, and hence the name Silicon Valley. Right in the middle, we have this institution here. This we call the Harvard of the West. It's uh, Stanford University. Now, Stanford was really unique amongst the institutions in America in that it was, it, was, it was funded and built by a businessman who believed you should reach into the community and support business because academia and business had historically been separate. But here, they were joined together. And in fact, Lee DeForest was arrested for securities fraud. He was something of a scoundrel, but the president of Stanford thought that his vacuum tube was a pretty good idea, bailed him out. So it went that far. And you saw this slide before. This is one of our great shrines, this little garage. And it's really where Hewlett and Packard did their first work. And the, the whole garage business continued. And authentically, this is where Apple started. And that's where Steve and Steve built the uh, Apple I. It was on a, a wood platform, a very primitive computer. They sold a few to their home brew club and then quickly morphed into the Apple II, and you know the rest. And the gar garage tradition continued. In the 90s, Google was founded here. This really was their office, not far from where Apple was founded. And that tradition of, of working in your parents' house, uh, these young kids, they're called flat fooders. People shove pizza under the door and taco chips and stuff because they never come out. You know, they stay in the room and they code. And then, 
They go to Harvard for about a week, and then they come out west. Well, I live in the, uh, in the little town of Woodside. Woodside is a rural community. Uh, we've got Stanford, we've got Sand Hill Road, and then Woodside. It's typical small town America. It's, uh, it's 5,417 people. It's got one church, one uh, grocery store, uh, one school, 250 venture capitalists, and about 15 billionaires. And you know, I'm not actually exaggerating at all. Um, I decided I would do business there. It seemed like a good place. I've been living there for some time. This is my restaurant, Bucks. And this is on a day when some people brought some interesting electric cars. That's the Tesla in the middle. That one on that side is the fastest electric car ever built, zero to 60 in 2.7 seconds at its fastest. And this is now a forgotten model. But the Tesla, as you know, is taking off. So this is just a little, a little restaurant in a strip center, and I built a lot of restaurants as a contractor, and I thought, you know, I could probably do that. I could probably run a restaurant. And uh, I decided to let myself go, and inside uh, turned it into a bit of a madhouse. And it's my canvas, actually. I consider myself something of an artist, and I just sort of started filling the place with stuff. And the customers came in, and. I brought in more stuff and I build a lot of these things and I, I acquire them all over the world. Um, I get the chance because of Bucks to meet some amazing people. This is Warren Buffett here. He's at the time when I was taking his wallet away from him, the richest guy in the world. Because it's my policy when you meet the richest guy in the world, just ask him for his wallet. It, it works. It's amazing. I actually got the wallet too. So this is one of my artifacts. So th there are stories all over the walls of Bucks. Uh, I get to commission paintings. Uh, we got stuff that uh, flies. I, I actually built this one. Stuff that uh, surfs. This was actually a table lamp in the 1930s. It's a six foot long alligator. You know, only in America would you make a table lamp out of an alligator. I think it's kind of wonderful. Uh, and uh, in fact, this is the movie, uh, uh, this is the model they use in the movie Does Boot. And um, so someone gave me that. I, I, people give me a remarkable amount of stuff. In the background, you got a sawfish shark snout collected by Jack London in 1910 in the South Seas. So it's a lot of fun to collect all this stuff. And uh, there's our town mascot, Woody, 20-foot uh, carved wooden salmon out in front of the restaurant. And here, in front of the fish, are some amazing characters. The guy in the middle is General Ivashov, the head of the Russian army. He came to visit one day uh, with Bill Perry, who was uh, the retired Secretary of Defense. And they're wearing their blue jeans and smoking cigarettes and just hanging out. And, and he gives me his business card. He said, if you're ever in Russia, look me up. So uh, I thought, yeah, OK. So I went to Russia, went to his office, went in, presented his car. They freaked out. What are you doing with his car? Well, he wasn't there. He was in Chechnya. But they didn't know that in the rest of Russia. So uh, we used his car to open doors. In fact, I decided I needed a Russian spacesuit. So we went out to Zvezda, where the spacesuits are made. And I had an interpreter. We knocked on the door. We said, the general sent us. And they just opened the door. We went in and uh, got the spacesuit. And uh, it was interesting bringing it back through customs. You know, I had to actually sign a paper that said I was not going to fly in outer space in this suit. And since the cosmonaut was five foot two, I figured oh, I'd save signing that. And uh, they said, well, how do we figure out the value of this? I actually paid $12,000 for it, but I said, that nah, was a gift from the people of Russia. So they said, well, go on through us. You're not worth our time. Now they're about 50 grand, so it can be profitable doing this. Uh, and so we've had an ungodly amount of press. In fact, we've had a lot of German press too. That, that's probably why I'm here because at one point, this isn't him, but Klaus Kleber came and he did a show at Bucks and he said, uh, if you're looking for money in Silicon Valley, see this guy. Now that's not true. And I gotta tell you and anybody else that I can't hook you up with money. No one believes that. They come anyway. And uh, they pitch me all the time. I've heard some very interesting things. Uh, so. The press continued, and uh, I started to become confused with somebody of influence. And, uh, it, it, but I keep mocking myself. I mean, here I'm impersonating myself, and I get gigs. Uh, here I'm telling this Chinese crew that this is an actual mummy I have in my collection. It's a human being. And they're going, yeah, whatever, you know, writing it down. So, uh, but it's really about my customers. This is the... This is the uh, uh, 
the CNN filming a recreation of the founding of Hotmail because a lot of firms had their meetings with Bucks because really it's about the entrepreneur meeting the money because we're right next to Sand Hill Road where the majority of the venture capitalists are and they're the ones that have funded the new age. So as a result, Netscape was born here. Yahoo had their early pitches. Uh, PayPal was funded at Bucks, Hotmail, and s hundreds of other firms. Many, many firms went out of business at Bucks too. They had their last get-togethers there as everybody folded because they come and they go. You know, a, a lot of people like to use this expression that, you know, failure is an option, and that's true. You can fail and you can come back, but success right out of the box is a far better teacher. I like the Google model where they just start in college and they instantly become, you know, mega successes. That to me is, is a real lesson. Uh, this here is a great shot here. This is uh, Gordon Moore, one of our regular customers. He lives in town. He founded Intel. and. Moore's Law, where you know, our computing power you know, doubles every 18 months. And you'll, he'll get in line with the cowboys and the construction workers. He's just a regular guy. Andy Grove, he insists on going to the front of the line, but he has no law. And me, just wondering, what the heck am I doing here? Uh, but really, it's about families and the kids. Uh, it, you know, we're a neighborhood eatery. We, we do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we, just, we actually sell food. And when I say I'm just the pancake guy, I really am just the pancake guy. Uh, I can't hook you up with money. And we goof around a lot. This is where I, I promised to take these lobsters to Marine World after lunch, but I took them in the kitchen instead. Didn't work out too well for them. We get all kinds of visitors at Bucks, actually. These are some neighborhood horses. These are actually full-grown horses, and uh, you're not supposed to bring them in a restaurant in the United States, but I make the rules. So I get to meet great personalities that drop by. John Cleese, uh, he plays a really stuffy, uptight, unhappy Englishman. I got to know him, and you know he's actually not acting. That's who he is. Uh, so <laughs> I get to meet famous Americans. Um, oh, I don't know how that get in there. Um, uh, yeah, or, or Euro-Americans here. Uh, this was Arnold before. Uh, oh, he's had such trouble lately, hasn't he? Our, our politicians, they get in such trouble. <laughs> oh, I love that guy. Oh, man. Uh, Shimon Perez. You know, it's amazing the, the heads of state we get in. Sarkozy was in last year, and uh, here I am teaching him, you know, I've got the whole world here, Mr. President. Uh, Al Gore, he brought us global warming. Uh, oh, this guy here, this guy, I don't know what I was saying. He opens his mouth a lot. He was, he just announced for president, Newt Gingrich, that he was running, but he, he made a mistake. He actually said something that was slightly critical of the Republican Party, and so he stuffed his foot in that open mouth, and that was the end of him. Because it just takes one little criticism of the Republicans. They're a bunch of yahoos, the Republicans. Not in a good way either. So, ah, here's the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong. Um, the world beating a path to my door. Uh, this, uh, this is Heidi Fly. She's our most famous madam in America. She's the one that put Charlie Sheen on the map with her little black book. And uh, God, I love her. And I get to hang around with a lot of interesting people, friends of mine. You know, Matt Groening, he did The Simpsons. But it's not all about the human beings. I live in the woods. I live in the woods right above Woodside. And this is my neighbor's camel, Omar. He's got zebras and a couple of ostriches and camels. They eat a lot. He's not much of a fence builder, uh, but our friends, uh, our, our friends are pretty wild. Sometimes they throw these fabulous parties. Here's a friend of mine who threw a party uh, his 50th birthday, and he invited 300 of his closest friends. Crosby, Stills, and Nash was the house band, and everybody stayed overnight. He built this tent village for us, <laughs> so on his ranch. Yeah. Oh, God, we have a lot of fun, but we work pretty hard, right? Here's another friend of mine. He's got the world's largest army tank collection. It was in Woodside. 65 army tanks and about another 150 pieces of major military gear, and it all runs. And on July 4th, we have a good time. We go out in his yard and crush cars. With all these venture capitalists and all this crazy money and, and this great road, Sand Hill Road, we decided a few years ago to have a race. This is the Sand Hill Challenge. It's a soapbox derby race for design wackos and venture capitalists, lawyers, anybody who wanted to participate. These are actually gravity-powered cars. They were pushed down for 50 feet and then rolled down the road. One of these cars came equipped with a TV camera and a monitor because they couldn't really see out of the windshield. And, he never saw the finish line, so they just went piling into the hay bales, and he was thrown out through the front, went to the hospital. It was a real race. We had a great time. Uh, ran for about five years. 
Uh, these are the winning cars the second year, well, first and second. And, but it costs a lot to build these cars. A car like this would cost $100,000 if you had to pay for it. There was a lot of donated money, and we raised a lot of money for charity. But after the Internet stock market bubble burst, we couldn't afford to run this race, so we uh, decided to use little old ladies instead. And this is a wheelchair race we had. There was uh, this one woman over here. It's 104 years old, and she did not win. I'd love to tell you she won, but she didn't win. Um, but, yeah, injuries in this race, too, believe it or not. And, you know, they, yeah, they're very fragile, these old women, I discovered. But, and some are delightfully ghoulish. You know, these are some of my favorites here. We see them every year at Christmas. Yikes. Uh, uh, so this is my restaurant. This is what we do. And in, in Silicon Valley, it's, it's, it's really true that, that young people come forward, come up with these brilliant ideas and get funded. All that mythology you hear about is really based on reality. We saw it with Steve Jobs. We see it with Facebook today. And the thing about some of these people is they're fully authentic. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, until about a year ago, only owned one pair of shoes. He really didn't care about the money. And it's really amazing that people can transcend that. God knows I can't. People ask sometimes, what's the coolest thing that's ever happened at Bucks? And, and it's really about the families and, and, and the fun people that come in. These we call the thousand-year-old women. They went to the fourth grade together, and they created this little club. They're now in their 80s. When you add them all up, they're a thousand years old. They come in every year for their big celebration around Christmas. They've only lost one of their members. You add them all up and they're a thousand years old. And on that same day, my good friends came in with two-week-old twins. She used to work for me. He's one of my best friends, and I introduced them, and there are the twins. So it's really about community. It's more than just about business. It's, uh, it's kind of just what I do. And uh, the big news is, the big news is, we got our Zeppelin back. <laughs> Thank you.